Northern Uganda. I work for Invisible Children as a student mentor in the scholarship program in Uganda. I'm so excited to be here today and I'm so humbled for this opportunity that I have to share my story with you. As you saw in the update video, I grew up in Northern Uganda. And just like Tony and thousands of other kids in Northern Uganda, I grew up in the same brutality and hostility, living in a war zone. Each time I reflect and look back on the many instances that I survived, the rebels' killings and abductions in our region when I was growing up, I count myself to be a survivor because it was not easy when I was growing up. I'd like to share with you briefly a personal story of just one of the many hard times that I lived through. Every evening from our home village, we would have to leave home to go and seek refuge in the town center to be safe from the rebels. And there was one evening, about the time we were to leave home, it started raining. We thought the rain would stop, but it went on until it was too dark, and we decided to spend that night home in the village. But it so happened that the rebels attacked our village that very night. We had gunshots, me and my other siblings. Then we decided to sneak out and go into the jungle as hideout. But as we were moving out, the rebels had already surrounded our compound, and we did not know. We had them shout from a distance, and all of a sudden, they started firing gunshots at us. We ran towards the main road that connects to town, but as we were approaching the main road, we had gunshots from ahead of us again, and we got so confused. The government troops were actually coming to rescue our village, but when they heard our footsteps, and because it was dark, they thought we were all rebels, and they started shooting indiscriminately. The rebels from behind had the government shootings, so they took their cover, like an ambush behind, closed in, and in less than one minute, these two forces got engaged in a firefight, and we realized we were caught up in the middle of this fire exchange. The rebel troops behind us and the government troops ahead of us. It was so hard, we were all young, we could just see bullets whistling in the air, and it was so unfortunate, one of my brothers was hit that very night. A bullet either from the government troops or the rebels, we couldn't tell. He fell down, but none of us noticed at that time. Until in the morning, when we wanted to go back home and the gunshots had stopped, then we realized he was not with us. We searched in the jungle and found him soaked in blood. We helped him back home, but because he lost too much blood all through the night, nothing could save his life. He passed away that day. Besides, in that one night attack, the rebels burned the entire village. All the settlements in our compound, they burned all the huts with all our belongings, food stuff in the house, clothes, my book, school uniform. All that we had was gone. That was a very trying moment for me and the family because we didn't know where else to turn to. But we had no choice, we had to live on. Growing up as a child, I knew peace just a few years ago because I was born at the time when the war started, the insurgency in our region, and all through the time I was growing up in my childhood, I never understood the meaning of peace. And I had to live with whatever surrounded me. But as I speak now, what happened to me and my family is still happening in Congo. The rebels left our region in 2007, and our region started seeing relative peace, but they moved into a neighboring country called Congo. And as I speak, they are still continuing with these atrocities. They are still abducting young children and forcing them to fight as child soldiers. They are still abducting young girls and force them to be sex slaves or wives of the rebel commanders. They are mutilating, killing, and displacing these villages. And for most times, attacks on these villages are not known to the outside world because they do not have any way to communicate. 
there's been massacres, there's been attacks, and they are just bearing all of this in silence because they are in a very remote community, they do not have any road network, no cell phone service, no radio communication. And Invisible Children has come out with a protection plan to help save the lives of these innocent people who are suffering in northeastern Congo. And as you saw in the update video, Invisible Children has a plan to set up radio towers to help these communities communicate and also to put up a child soldier rehabilitation center in this region where the conflict is still going on. And as Invisible Children, we believe that if we come together, we can answer the cries of these people. As Ronald Reagan once said that we cannot help everyone, but everyone can help someone. That expresses a great power of solidarity that if we come together, we can reach out and hold the hands of so many victims, even a thousand miles away. We can reach out beyond our bounds and help these people who are suffering this unearned injustice. And we, we are here today, me and my other teams. We share our story and we believe that at least we can reach out to these people and help them. So thank you so much for listening to me and my teammate Brian is coming over here. He's gonna tell you how best you can get involved and how you can lend a helping hand in saving the lives of these victims. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank Joffrey for sharing such a, such a vulnerable story about his life growing up um, in northern Uganda during this war times. Um, as you saw in the update video, um, we have ways you can get involved. Um, you can join our tribe program, which is a monthly reoccurring donation, and it all goes towards implementing our protection plan. Um, or you can sign up for our 25 event. Um, it's a good visual way to raise awareness in America about the war that's going on um, and help encourage our um, representatives and senators to support um, funding the bill that um, went through Congress. And also, the majority of our merchandise that we have over there in the corner um, is made in northern Uganda by people who have been victims of this war. And it's helped them gain a sustainable income. Um, and they're able to help their fellow um, villagers and people that they live in their communities. Um, so I just want to thank you for taking this time during your lunch hour to, to watch this documentary. Um, and if you have any questions regarding the film um, Invisible Children, um, or the conflict itself, my teammates and I would love to answer them. Um, and so we can do that at um, the next breakout session. Um, so thank you again.
has a, today's program has a theme of, a partial theme of zero waste. However, with war, there is no zero waste. The largest waste from war is a loss of human life, as we've just seen. Yet some would argue that, that in many situations, those who were killed were luckier than those who were disfigured, defiled, raped repeatedly, maimed and tortured, left to live with these misdeeds forever scarred, forever changed, doomed to a slower, more painful and less forgiving death. Some people, in fact, face war and devastation and simply give up. We lose all hope. We just take it as the given, inevitable. And yet others find a voice against violence and use their hands and feet and take action, right action. Today is about finding our voice for peace and discovering ways we can take right action. Each year, the Peace Mind and Body Club selects a group or an individual to honor with the Golden West College Peace Studies Award. This year's recipients will be given to an organization which has given a voice to an invisible war and taken action, right action, in addressing these needs and those left in the path of its devastation. Invisible children. They noticed in a large way that since 1986, the beginning of the war in northern Uganda, over 100,000 innocent civilians have been killed. Over 30,000 children have been abducted. And at the height of the displace, displacement, 1.8 million people had been displaced. Invisible Children is a social and political and global movement using the transformative power of a story to change lives. By inspiring youth culture to value creatively, idealism and sacrifice, this movement fuels the most effective and adaptable innovative program in the world as we've just seen. It began in the spring of 2003. It has evolved so that ICA, in order to better meet the developing needs of Central Africa in the summer of 2010, ICA launched the Congo Initiative, as we've just seen. They have a three-part structure, as you've seen. They use media to make us aware, to make everyone aware, to give a picture to the things that we don't ever see on national television or in typical classrooms, and a movement that is fueled by people taking time out of their lives and dedicating it to going on the road, to helping us see, and to raise funds. And a mission to change Central Africa so that these villagers can communicate to, uh, and not just that, but also to provide programs for education and um, the things that we saw today in the campaigns. And so it is an honor, a privilege, a humbling act that I will present the 2011 award, the Golden West College Peace Award, in recognition of this important work that the invisible children are doing to forward the work of peace and make us aware globally. So if their representatives would come forward.
beyond humbled to be here and accept this award on behalf of Invisible Children. Um, my name is Chelsea, and as some of you saw in the film, I am um, one of the full-time volunteers for Invisible Children, also known as a roadie. Um, so what we do is go around and we share this story of war with people in hopes that they will respond um, to call and act upon peace. And so we are very excited to share this story with you all today. Um, and when I was invited here to speak, um, I was asked to answer the question, what is Invisible Children doing to promote peace? Not only in Central East Africa, but also here in the US. Um, which, when I was asked, I thought I knew the question right away after working for Invisible Children for a year. But um, had to humble myself a little bit and really take a look at what Invisible Children is doing. Um, so I started by looking at our mission statement that's on the front of our website. Um, and it says, um, our mission is to end the use of child soldiers in Joseph Coney's rebel war and to restore LRA affected communities to peace and prosperity. So I began to look at that and say, well, what are we doing in the first part of that to break down the mission statement? What are we doing for the first part that says to end the use of child soldiers in Joseph Coney's rebel war? Um, and like most of you saw currently, we, we've put out a protection plan that's going to put up radio towers so that local villages can know where this rebel group is and know how to respond accordingly. We're working to fund groups to actually go in and rescue these child soldiers and then ultimately working to fund a full-scale rehabilitation center for these children to come back and be normalized back into society, learn basic life skills, um, as well as eventually be reunited with their families, um, which is something we're very excited about. Taking a leap to the Congo as an organization was a very big move, and to actually know that the work that we're doing is directly saving lives is, is incredible, and it's truly humbling to be a part of. So. Um, looking at that and seeing that we are working to promote peace over in Central East Africa by directly combating the war that's going on. So I was looking at that and saying, well, of course that's promoting peace. Um, but there's a phrase that we throw around our office a lot, and I'm sure that most of you have heard today, that the absence of war doesn't entirely equal peace. Um, so asking myself that, saying, okay, well, we're working to, to end the conflict, but um, on the flip side, what, what are we doing to make sure that conflict doesn't return? And so um, I began again looking through our website and seeing our microeconomic initiatives that we've set up, which I could go on for days about, but since I know most of, our, uh, most of us in this room aren't as jazzed on microeconomic initiatives as I am, I will share with you one of my personal favorites. Um, it's called the Mend Bag Program. And the idea behind it is that we are mending the human connection between the maker and the consumer. And it was designed for women who were victims of war and women who had been abducted and forced to be sex slaves. So what Invisible Children did is um, they, they saw these women come back who had escaped from war. They go through a rehabilitation process where they're taught um, life skills as women. So sewing is um, uh, one of the skills that they learned. And they saw that, that they could do something with these things they were learning and provide them jobs and businesses and real, a holistic approach to providing economic help, I guess, in these areas. So what they've done is Invisible Children has taken the skill that these women learn of sewing and they provide them with a job of making the handbags. We have a few of them over there that are yellow. Um, and then when each woman is done making her bag, she sews her name on the inside so that you know directly whose life you're affecting when you buy the bag, um, that it's not just a cute project Invisible Children is putting on, but that we're directly changing lives and, and really picking up where the wake of this war has left off, um, really investing in the lives there and making sure that we're not just throwing money at a fire and, and not really doing anything, but that we can really invest in people's lives by taking a tangible approach to investing um, in the small business owners of these women. So once they graduate from the program of making these bags, they've learned business savings and loan. So if Invisible Children, one of our mottos here is to sell ourselves out of business. So if we were to completely fail tomorrow, 
the, the men women, people like the men women, or in our other economic initiatives, would be able to run completely fine without our support because they've learned the skills, the proper skills of, of business and of savings and how to invest and um, what it means to provide for their community and for their family. So that without invisible children, um, hopefully one day we can see this country restored to its fullest. Um, and that's ultimately what we want to do. So I saw that and saw that we were really working in every way to promote peace in Central East Africa by not only stopping the war, but also picking up where the wake of the war has left off and really providing a sustainable, peaceful environment for these people. So then I began to ask myself the other question, what are we doing in the US to promote peace? Which was an easier question for me to answer because I found out about Invisible Children myself when I was a freshman in high school which was a few days ago, so, <laughs> only kidding. Um, but really, it was like yesterday. Um, we, I found out about Invisible Children when I was a, a freshman in high school, and I remember sitting there and watching the documentary, and for the first time in my life, I realized that there was an entire world other than my own. That my world actually went outside of high school and outside of the house I lived in, outside of the street I lived on. And the reason that problems like this happen is because of selfishness like my own. And realizing that we as individuals can personally take steps, no matter how young, to, to further peace. And once we realize that we're capable of that, we refuse to settle for anything short of that. And so, I began getting involved with invisible children, and not only invisible children, but taking steps um, with my friends and my neighbors, because it's the same injustice if we can't get along with our neighbor as the injustice that's happening in Central East Africa. So I began taking small steps to approach peace in that way. Um, and now I, I realize that if, if all people, if all of us take time to look at the world around us and realize that it's actually a lot bigger than us, um, that we're actually capable of making change and that peace is actually possible if we work hard together. Um, if we realize this, we, we should refuse to settle for anything less and, and we should impose that belief on other people in hopes that they will grasp it and share it with everyone else. So we're, we're very excited to be a part of a, a global movement like this. Um, and I just want to end on the note by saying um, we, we want to take steps every day to promote peace here and um, we are humbled to be a part of so many different groups today that are working to do the same thing. So thank you for joining in us today and thank you so much for recognizing um, the peace that we are truly all working towards.